All right. <clears throat> Today is Wednesday, January 19th, 2011, and we're going to talk a little bit about a, um, a, a great topic. I, I have a kind of a, a whimsical title because it's a, the master of understatement. Um, things that make learning difficult, ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. An awfully big topic, um, that's why I feel like it's a bit of a whimsical topic. Whenever I give the lecture about ADHD, um, I think about it in terms of a textbook and I think about it in terms of chapters. And I think there are four chapters to talk about with ADHD. First chapter is know what the heck ADHD is. The second chapter is know who the professionals are and the stakeholders um, who are involved with either recognizing, diagnosing, or treating ADHD. Number three is know, and imagine that I'm talking to parents, know your child and know yourself in this situation. Um, and then finally, chapter four, know the management of ADHD and how to proceed in getting that treatment. Um, number one, um, whenever I think about ADHD, I, I always think about these questions that people pitch to me. For instance, does ADHD even exist? And my answer um, is absolutely yes. Of course, there are some people um, that you will run into that um, are on the contrary that say that ADHD doesn't exist. And what I point to from the scientific standpoint is um, there are a number of things. There is, for instance, the discussion of uh, brain anatomy. And we know that there are parts of the brain specifically that are smaller in children who have ADHD. We are not to the place where you can get a brain scan and say, oh, your brain is this size, therefore you have the diagnosis of ADHD. But there have been some very nice studies looking at children with ADHD and children without ADHD. And overall, children with ADHD have smaller volumes of brain. Turns out as those children mature, their brain matures and gains more volume um, at the same rate as children without ADHD, but at the end result, those ch uh, children with ADHD end up with slightly smaller brains too. So there's the brain um, data, uh, the anatomy data. Then there's the chemistry data. And at this point in our business, we still like to use the word hypothesis. There is a dopamine hypothesis that dopamine is one of the chemicals involved in ADHD misfunction. That there is norepinephrine is one of the chemicals involved in the dysfunction. Um, and then there's the discussion of neurocircuitry. That is, now that we know what the brain is and we think we know what, this, what the chemicals are, what is the pathways that connect the frontal cortex to the hypothalamus and other circuitry that we start to call the executive circuit or the frontal lobe circuit or however you want to put that. And um, there's circuitry involved too. Then there's the uh, topic of um, how do you make a diagnosis so that it's a valid diagnosis? We're not in the business of walking around making things up. And then once there is a valid diagnosis, the valid diagnosis where we know what the symptoms are, what the diagnostic criteria are, how can we professionals all be on the same page and become what is known as reliable? So if you walk in the door and see 10 people who claim to be experts on ADHD, um, do you get eight, nine, 10 of them agreeing which cases of ADHD are ADHD and which cases of potential ADHD do not appear to be ADHD? And that's reliability. <clears throat> so a lot of these comments I like to be just kind of um, just kind of statements. You know, what is ADHD really? Um, the words in, this, in the title, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, that, by the way, is the title since 1994. Prior to that, there had been many different titles. The favorite one that I still hear is ADD, or Attention Deficit Disorder. Um, and, and parents and children often like to make the distinction. Yes, there's the attention part, but there's not the hyperactivity part or vice versa. Since 1994, the title says Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, and then you put a comma after that, and then you dictate or you declare whether or not it is attention um, inattentive type or hyperactive type, or in most cases, probably combined type. So the words that kind of need defining in the title, what is an attention deficit? And the way I think about that is you cannot fully attend to the, to the information at hand. A child with ADHD cannot fully attend to the task or information at hand because they're so busy trying to ignore other stimuli going on around them. So um, in the old days, some of my mentors would use the phrase, it is not an attention disorder. It is an inattention disorder in that you can't ignore unimportant uh, information. Um, in the diagnosis, it implies that both inattention and hyperactivity are equally important, and that's absolutely true. A child with inattention can have every bit as much impairment as a child with just hyperactivity. 
And over time, there has been this um, force that uh, begins to say, yes, we have diagnostic criteria. There are 18 of them. We could you know, show you pages of what they are. We could just explain the symptoms to you. But overall, <clears throat> those symptoms appear to be um, a function of this thing we call executive function. And when, we were talk when I was talking a bit about the brain, the frontal lobe, the circuitry, et cetera, the executive function um, aspect could basically be thought of as a filter. The job of the executive function, the executive cortex, the executive brain, is to take unimportant information from the outside and make sure it doesn't slip in and leak into the brain. And it's also equally important that the, uh, the network, the filter of the executive brain, take unimportant information from the inside and help it not spill into the outside. So <clears throat> important people who have talked about executive function over time, um, I think about Martha Denkla at Hopkins, I think about Russell Barkley up at Syracuse, I think about, I have to pause for a second, I think about Tom Brown over at Yale, um, and these are people that have published and discussed um, executive function, and really kind of molded how we all think about executive function. I think Martha Denkla, to my knowledge, started talking about this in the early 90s, and Barkley probably at the same time. Um, Barkley uh, probably is the most um, well-known speaker on the executive function topic, and, and, and I've been a person fortunate enough to have seen him lecture on this topic. Barclay talks very specifically about executive function. We physicians like to talk in generalities about, well, you know, there's the filter, and then there's this, and there's that. And Barclay tries to break down into very nice pieces that are very helpful for conceptualizing ADHD and also kind of understanding children that come into the office. He talks about executive function as a, in five specific segments um, that are easily kind of broken down. First segment, he talks about self-management, which refers to time management. He talks about self-organization, which refers to problem solving. He talks about self-discipline, which is involved in inhibition of behavior. There is the, t uh, the, the topic of self-motivation, and then there's the topic of self-regulation or emotions. And the topic of self-regulation or emotion, um, for obvious reasons, has become really interesting as far as how we conceptualize ADHD in addition to or compared to other emotional problems. For instance, anxiety, which is very common and can be very debilitating. Uh, for instance, depression, which is very common and can be very debilitating. And the fact that the emotional component of ADHD and the emotional component of anxiety and the emotional component of depression um, have a great deal of overlap. And so one of our jobs is to try to tell the difference between when there's great emotionality, when there's great distress, when there's great anxiety or sadness or irritability in a child, is it attributed to ADHD? Is it attributed to anxiety? Is it attributed to depression, et cetera? And how do we tell them apart? <clears throat> Tom Brown talks a little bit differently about executive function, and he puts just slightly different words on the on these sub aspects of executive function. He talks about activation, which is basically um, preparation and, and beginning. He talks about attention, he talks about effort, he talks about emotionality, he talks about memory, and he talks about action. What, what I'm always interested to hear these subtitles because they're different than the diagnostic criteria for the most part, um, and they have more intuition. That is, when I talk to children, I don't like to pull out the list of the 18 criteria for ADHD. I like to say to a child, tell me about your day. And then I like to say to the parents, tell me about your child's day and tell me what it's like parenting them throughout the day. Um, and when you say certain things like, how does the morning go? Tell me about the morning routine and how hard is it to get out the door on time? You start to pin down ideas like, how well does a child's executive function perform? Um, activation means you're able to get out of bed. <laughs> Children and adolescents with ADHD are the kids who are famous for ignoring their alarm clock and not getting out of bed. Um, but activation means um, you begin, you know, stop, you have to stop sleeping and you have to begin the day and that's an aspect of executive function, for instance. Um, activation involves organization, uh, prioritizing, uh, making the first decision to begin work. Focus is about not just focusing and honing in on something that's important, but sustaining the effort and shifting the attention. And shifting the attention is really an important aspect of kids that we see because parents will often come in and say, well, you know, my child does a great job watching television. My child does a great job playing video games and they can lock into these things that they really like, uh, sports even, lacrosse. And um, as a result of that, people will say, well, because they have such a great ability to function or great ability to focus on things that they like, they can't have ADHD because they obviously have great attention span. 
But um, one of the hallmarks about ADHD is that fascination still comes to play. In fact, fascination might be a big issue. That is, any brain uh, that is fascinated with a topic will lock in on that specific fascinating function. Video games are fascinating. Television is fascinating. Activity in the middle of sports can be fascinating. And remember, ADHD means it's hard to ignore um, the other information. That is, it's hard to ignore the fascinating information in order to participate in the mundane information, which is most of the important things that we have to do. So the ability to shift attention to the task that's important, shift out due to small distractions, shift back, is definitely a function of executive function and part of the focus sub-aspect. Sub um, effort. Um, <clears throat> Um, there are a lot of different words, and I'm going I'm to talk about that in a few minutes, that people will use to describe teenagers, for instance, who have ADHD, that they don't try hard enough, that they don't work hard enough, that they don't prioritize or have values about what's important in their life. And it's funny that, you know, the effort part means that sometimes children and adolescents with ADHD will just um, rush through things and not do their best, and their goal is to complete it, to, to kind of defeat the frustration that goes with these boring, mundane things. Um, but effort means regulating how alert you are during the task, sustaining the effort with high quality and, and appropriate speed, and then this thing called processing speed that, show, that will show up later on, when we do specific testings for children who um, were looking for learning problems or, or ADHD symptoms, the word processing shows up as kind of a buzzword because processing speed is extremely important in learning and managing um, all sorts of uh, topics related to um, anxiety, um, depression, ADHD, etc. <clears throat> Um, emotionality, key words for ADHD are words like um, frustration. Um, frustration is, I think, defined as that negative emotion that happens when um, your ADHD symptoms get in the way and you can't get past the ADHD symptoms to manage the normal fluctuations of ADHD throughout the day. So for instance, if we're talking about anxiety, a child with anxiety has an abnormal amount of internal anxiety that they have, cannot modify or they cannot modulate and shrink appropriately. Um, a child who has ADHD likely has the normal amount in the normal range of emotions. However, um, because they have executive function symptoms and ADHD symptoms, those distractions and those difficulties um, with activating with self-management, self-organizing, et cetera, create an inordinate amount of frustration. And another way to look at that is that ADHD, from an emotional standpoint, is a situation where um, a child has an enormous um, uh, 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 problem managing frustration, frustration intolerance, that we would call it. <clears throat> then this, there's this idea of memory. Yes, there's processing speed, and how well does your brain get from here to there? But there's a, you know, like a computer, there's random access memory that we have, and there's also kind of deep memory that we have. And the ability to have the short-term working memory going on so that you can place yourself in the moment and learn in the moment and process in the moment is a, an aspect of executive function. Just like um, accessing recall is an important part of that. And then finally, actions and behaviors, monitoring one's own actions, self-regulating, modifying one's own actions um, are important parts. Now, <clears throat> executive function has become a, an interesting conversation, but executive function per se has not leaped across the void and become the diagnosis for ADHD. And today, when we make the diagnosis of ADHD, we still have to, quote, follow the book. And the book that we talk about is the DSM, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. We're currently on four, which has, again, been out since 1994. And the current title is uh, uh, DSM-4 Text Revision, which has been out since probably 2001. Um, we hear talk that the next DSM is probably going to be out in about 2013. There have been some changes made to um, DSM um, in the DSM according to ADHD um, in the years to come. Um, and apparently, so far, there's small things, such as the age of onset. I'll, I'll talk in a minute about the age of onset, but we used to say in the old days, currently still, that you have to have onset of these symptoms that are apparent before age seven. 
Um, and they've removed that criteria and basically said teenage years, so that you have to have symptoms obvious before the teenage years, because making a distinction of age 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 really is not all that important. It's basically it happens during childhood or it happens before teenage, is just the, the hair that they decided to split on that. Diagnostic criteria can be a little bit boring. There are basically there are 18 symptoms. You have to have them for longer than six months. Um, you, to make the diagnosis, you must have six of nine symptoms on the inattention phase, and you have to have six of nine on the hyperactivity impulsive phase. Um, I already mentioned the age of onset, <clears throat> and there's also discussion about impairment. And impairment is very subjective, and so impairment is an extremely important aspect about making the distinction between ADHD and not ADHD. Impairment, as far as that book is concerned, the DSM, talks about things like impairment in family um, um, life, impairment in social life, impairment in internal distress management, um, impairment, um, and for this aspect, they talk about in ADHD, they talk about two specific ones. They talk about uh, social and they talk about academic, and I think they even talk about work, which is kind of interesting. Not too many children and adolescents are involved in work. Um, and, of course, the idea that it's not exclusive to some other thing that might be going on, that is anxiety, depression, etc., and it's not better accounted for by something like anxiety, de depression, or the so-called Asperger's spectrum. So those are important things. The list, again, are tedious. I can, you know, rattle off a couple of them, too. You know, symptoms of inattention. Fails um, to pay close attention to details or makes careless mistakes. Difficulty in sustaining attention in tasks or play, not seem to listen when spoken to directly, symptoms like that. And again, we can usually ask the question and people start to gloss over when we ask those questions. So I would like to have some, some forms, some worksheets to show parents and children so that they can remember those symptoms. But I also like to ask those symptoms in the context of what the day is like so you can really tease them out in real time and how a child really lives their lives. Hyperactivity is described as fidgety, which is movement of hands or feet, or squirminess, which is more of a full body movement in the chair. Leaving the seat um, when being seated is expected to, uh, to occur. Uh, dinner, for instance, classroom, for instance. Um, running and climbing excessively, and, and that's interesting because don't young people have ex seemingly excessive amounts of energy, but the truth is children with normal energy and children with excessive energy in the hyperactivity realm may appear to be subjective, um, but um, w through enough experience it, it, it turns out to be fairly uh, easy to tell them apart. Um, impulsivity, for instance, blurting out answers, verbal impulsivity. Difficulty waiting turn, uh, for instance, to be served for a meal or waiting in line or playing games. Um, or interrupting or intruding on other children or adults with their own agenda rather than being able to be patient. <clears throat> in the textbook comes a lot of more interesting day-to-day -day stuff because um, other, under the other part or what they call associated features of ADHD comes a lot of really interesting information. Um, mood liability, that means frustration, sadness, anxiety, comes quickly and goes up and down. Uh, the concept of demoralization, which is a child who can't concentrate well and is starting to suffer the slings and arrows of their ADHD symptoms, um, will sometimes feel beaten down because they're trying hard and they are not um, without uh, a dedication. It's just they have a hard time functioning and so they become to feel, they, they find themselves demoralized that this kind of emotional negative place where you're doing your best but you're not having success. Then there's this negative aspect of, they use the word dysphoria, which is literally a negative low symptom that can go along with ADHD symptoms. And then there's associated rejection by peers sort of sliding down the social ladder. And then this concept of poor self-esteem, that is, you're, you're trying your best, you're finding that you're not concentrating, you're not having success in your schoolwork, you're not having success socially, uh, children are kind of rejecting you, uh, parents, uh, adults are being grumpy and redirecting you, and overall, with sort of systematic failure in these different arenas, a child can come to feel um, uh, inadequate, low self-esteem, feeling poorly literally because they're having so much symptoms, uh, symptomatology related to ADHD that they can't control on their own. Other associated features are really important when it comes to discussing with parents and, and other prof and professionals, that is, um, is the idea of relationships that the DSM talks about in associated features. Uh, quote, uh, these relationships are characterized by conflict, resentment, 
discord, antagonism, and it opens the door to kind of paint a child with ADHD, especially unrecognized ADHD, paint them in a very difficult light because there are, there are other symptoms that are attributed. For instance, kids with ADHD will be called lazy or irresponsible or oppositional or willful, etc. And our job is to take those negative uh, constellations or those, or those negative uh, uh, misattributions, I like to call them, and figure out what it is that is due to the ADHD symptoms so that we can take kids at their face value as being you know, good, positive citizens who are trying their best and not marring or saying negative things about their, their temperament or their parenting, etc. Um, the other valuable thing that DSM adds to the mix is this idea that, you know, there are no, and I, I could quote this, there's no um, laboratory test, neurological assessment, or attentional assessment that has been established as a diagnostic tool. So we like to use rating scales as tools to help recognize ADHD. Um, certainly um, PhD psychologists will do this test battery which includes tests of achievement and tests of I cognitive IQ and things of that nature and while those are extremely valuable at the end of the day the diagnosis is still made on by virtue of those diagnostic criteria any of the research studies that you that um, have gone on over the years hundreds of treatment studies always use the diagnostic criteria um, and so when I'm talking to parents, I'll sometimes say, well, you know, it's easy to split hairs, it's easy to take a guess, but if you really want the hard core diagnosis, I will say, well, you know, research criteria, if we had to enroll your child in a research study for ADHD or not, you would meet these criteria or not meet these criteria. So I stick to the DSM and the NIMH model of, at this particular point, all tests may be valuable, but it's a matter of getting the proper information from different sources from parents, from school, from other adults, different settings, and it's a diagnosis of um, meeting criteria as opposed to meeting uh, test criteria because you did it a, a, some kind of a test or, or study and had a negative finding. There's no blood test, there's no diagnostic screen, or excuse me, there's no diagnostic study. Um, <clears throat> associated features also temper outbursts, parent bossiness, stubbornness, poor frustration tolerance, um, insistence that requests be, na be made. So <clears throat> basically that's ADHD. A couple other things of note, um, you know, when people criticize the concept of ADHD, they like to say something like, well, you know, boys will be boys. And when you say the concept boys will be boys, you're basically invoking a, t a type of bias, saying, well, um, boys are like that. Boys are a bit more uh, impatient. Boys are a bit more impulsive and hyperactive, and it is normal for boys to have that range of behaviors. And while it may be true that boys tend to be more hyperactive, and how about this? Boys with ADHD tend to have more ADHD symptoms with hyperactivity plus um, inattention, and girls with ADHD tend to have a girl variety where it tends to be more heavy in the inattention symptoms and less in the hyperactivity symptoms. Those are characterizations that appear to be accurate. And the truth is boys are diagnosed with ADHD three or four times more often than girls are, but it is a disorder that, that affects both boys and girls, and it is not a fine line distinction that boys are hyperactive. The truth is most boys do not suffer ADHD. We think about uh, ADHD as occurring in something like 5% or so. There are studies that have ranges between 5 and 10%, whether or not you look at children, adolescents, or adults. I stick with a bit of a conservative 5 or 6% that goes back a number of decades with that epidemiology. Um, but if you think about it that way, um, that means that uh, five percent of children have ADHD, not ubiquitous. A everyone has ADHD um, and everyone says that they have ADHD. A lot of that lingo, um, everyone has it, it's overdiagnosed, I think comes from the understanding of certain professionals or the understanding of parents as they interact with professionals, whether or not they're talking with pediatricians or psychiatrists or neurologists or nurses or physician assistants or psychologists or social workers or other therapists or teachers and principals, tutors, life coaches, advocates, etc. People have their story and sometimes tongue in cheek I like to say everybody's an expert when it comes to ADHD. The problem with everybody being an expert is expertise 
can bring along with it a bit of bias that goes along with the expertise. So a person who finds themselves steeped in the tradition of traditional psychiatry may say, well, um, there are symptoms that are related to the, the children's life story and, and internal struggles that create the symptoms of ADHD. And so it's not ADHD, it's actually this internal struggle. Um, and other people may say, well, it's not really internal struggle, or nor is it uh, this genetic-based, uh, 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 anatomy-based frontal lobe executive function disorder. Um, it's simply an extreme of temperament, negative temperament, uh, extroverted temperament, uh, in, un, excuse me, uh, unstable temperament, where the impulsivity comes from personality, and it is, again, literally a boy being a boy, and that's their lot in life, and, that's, and there's no change in that. Um, and another uh, uh, way of looking at that, another bias that plays into that, is that these are really just behaviors, and then whenever you say the word behavior, then you pull the parent into it and say if the parent, if the child only had different parenting, or better parenting, or more parenting, and you can fill in the gaps, then these so-called learned behaviors would not have been learned, and if there was only just enough structure in the home and enough discipline, you could unlearn these. And I say this with a little smirk on my face because um, it's my job every day to discuss these things, and what I'm trying to do literally is cut through any of the bias that exists in either myself or in the people that I see and try to make a clear and clean diagnosis and a clear and clean psychiatric evaluation so that I can try to tell the difference between things like internal struggles or temperament or personality or the presence of a disease with an anatomical and genetic basis like ADHD. The thing about the bias of different professionals is that it really puts more pressure on the parents to try to make a good decision. Because if you walk in one door, you might get one answer, and if you walk in another door, you might get another answer. And probably every parent has had the experience that they hear one answer from their teachers in the, the school system, and then another answer from either a therapist or a pediatrician. And so the road becomes a little bit uh, murky and, and difficult for parents to, to travel. Um, <clears throat> there, uh, f with a longer conversation, I'd like to talk about the specific types of bias that people have, and probably um, it's, it's overkill in a conversation like this, but I, I like to recognize this phrase, I call it observational bias. Um, An observational bias happens when you're doing a research study where you try to set up the research in such a way that the person doing the study, the psychiatrist doing the study, for instance, can't Im implement their own bias about they think the treatment is good or the treatment is not good. That's one example of observational bias. But observational bias happens all over the place. If, for instance, um, if a child is acting up in class, it's easy for the teacher to introduce their observational bias where they will say things like, well, when we're doing something fun, um, this boy will behave and it is my observation that when things are not fun and they get frustrated that they become very undisciplined and very negative in their attitude and so observational bias leaks and the child has a bad attitude and so it's easy for that observational stuff to creep in and it's kind of hard to take it away because sometimes when a professional of any stature says this is my observation, my one-time observation of this one symptom, then parents will have to say, well, goodness, you know, this professional made that observation. It must be accurate. And so if we start to believe the, quote, accuracy of the every, quote, observational bias, then now there's real trouble in trying to make things clear and, and understand where things are at. Remember, with the backdrop of, of what we're talking about, children's learning, then attributions are extremely important because um, children with ADHD frequently have learning problems. That is, you take a child who has ADHD and you do special psychological testing where you're looking at IQ and achievement and probably 30% of kids with ADHD will end up having a specific named learning disorder like a order, uh, disorder of math, a disorder of written expression, disorder of reading. And um, flip-flop that and say if a kid walks in and is diagnosed with a named learning disorder, probably 30% of them have ADHD. So you can see where the hardware and the software and the adaptation executive function process overlaps between the two. But imagine if you have one ADHD alone, learning disorder alone, how hard it is to learn in a normal set, in a typical setting. And then imagine you add the two together. And then now imagine that you add demoralization because you're failing and not doing well. And then imagine you throw in a sprinkle of anxiety. Then you throw in a sprinkle of behavioral problems because um, now the child's trying to adapt and trying to accommodate falling down the ladder.
And then you throw in the concept of temperament because every child has a temperament, whether or not it's suited well to adapt to ADHD and learning or not, but then the uh, temperament will be stressed and personality will be stressed and you will get some negative uh, uh, exhibitions of mood and behavior in kids who are having a problem with learning and problems with uh, self-control.